death. With an increased awareness of our mortality, coupled with our instinct for self-preservation, comes unbearable anxiety. Researchers argue that we manage this anxiety by pursuing meaning in our lives, as much as we mind our individual selves and lifetimes. How much meaning and purpose do you have in your own life right now? Following our items from two different but related scales, one that measures our sense of meaningfulness and belongingness, items one to five, and one that measures whether we are undergoing a crisis of meaning, that is, judging our lives as empty and meaningless, items six to ten. Determine whether you agree or disagree with, or feel neutral, neither agree nor disagree, about each of these statements. One. I think that there is meaning in what I do. Two, I have a task in life. Three, I feel part of a bigger whole. Four, I lead a fulfilled life. Five, I think my life has a deeper meaning. Six, when I think about the meaning of my life, I find only emptiness. Seven, my life seems meaningless. Eight, I don't see any sense in life. Nine, I suffer from the fact that I don't see any point in life. 10. My life seems empty. It is that our sense of meaning rises steadily after we reach adulthood. It appears that meaningfulness is at its nadir when we are teenagers, rises steadily until age 35, remains stable from 35 to 45, and rises again starting at 45 and beyond. However, a frightening setback can make us question what we are doing on this earth. If you disagree with any of the first five items, and if you agree with any of the last five items, then I would recommend making the pursuit of meaning in life one of your priorities. There are many ways to find meaning and purpose. One is to establish the metric by which our life will be judged, and from today, to resolve to live each day in such a way that our life will be graded as success. 12-year-old Jesse's journey, for example, began with double vision, which turned out to be the first symptom of a brain tumor. In the two months following the diagnosis, she underwent chemotherapy, 30 rounds of radiation, and countless doctor visits. In those early days at the hospital, she would cry for hours, but after a while, she turned to the other patients. Jessie discovered that she found special kinship with the young kids and teens at the hospital who couldn't return home between treatments. Thus, instead of brooding about herself and allowing her illness to define her, she started thinking about others. With her families and her church's help, she founded a nonprofit foundation where donors can send joy jars to children, containers filled with t-shirts, candy, toys, and other age-appropriate items. Each one sold pays for another that she gives away. Although the final outcome is uncertain, as long as Jessie is alive, she has found meaning by boosting young patients' spirits and encouraging them never to give up as they battle their illnesses. Like Jessie, for many people, the pursuit of life purpose can be rooted in their desire to help others who are suffering, but it doesn't have to be. Many of us find meaning by linking our existence to something outside ourselves. This something may be other people. For example, imparting our values to our children who will outlive us, or improving the lives of the less fortunate. Institutions, for example, volunteering for a school or environmental agency. Value systems, for example, blogging about the importance of stem cell research or auto safety or whatever cause we care about. Or God, for example, praying or proselytizing our faith. Essentially, we are striving to achieve what researchers call symbolic immortality or a positive personal legacy. For example, by producing a child or a work of art that will outlive us, believing in the afterlife, investing in the well-being of future generations, perhaps via community activism, or simply making ah. some of life better in the future, via mentoring or teaching. Such personal life meaning can be gained in numerous ways and will depend on the fit between our preferences and values and the activities we choose to pursue. For example, art if we are artistic, worship if we are religious, community service if we are sociable, and technical achievement if we are scientific. As a result, no matter how terrified we are of our medical prognosis or our approaching death, feeling that we are part of something larger than ourselves, whether it's our church, our family, or even our nation, supplies us with a rudder to steer the rest of our life course and leads us to feel more centered and secure. The 
prepared mind. Your test results were positive, are some of our most dreaded words. The crossroads we face at that moment involves wallowing in despair versus moving on, living in the present versus poisoning our future. Once we stop accepting that our situation is the end of happiness, we will be prepared to take action, to embrace, adjust to, or make the best of each and every day. If moving on or savoring the present moment seems daunting or even unthinkable today, don't be concerned. The mobilize and minimize theory suggests that our immediate reactions, which often involve painful thoughts and feelings, will be short-lived, and the healthy long-term responses will take time to unfold. So instead of wallowing, make one or more of the recommendations I described a weekly goal, depending on what feels right to you. For example, you may choose to build and or reinforce your social support network, call an old friend and offer your ear, or hone your powers of attention by learning to meditate, or simply to be more mindful. Another time, you may resolve to begin setting time each day to enjoy the outdoors, even if it means contemplating the clouds outside your window on a frigid day, or learning what situations leave you in a pleasant mood and replicating them on a regular basis. Last but not least, take at least one step each week in the direction that helps you attain purpose in your life and secures your legacy. Chapter 9 I can't be happy when I know I'll never play shortstop for the Yankees. I'll never be a doctor or an astronaut. I'll never sleep with a lingerie model. A professor at the University of Missouri-Columbia studies our lost possible selves, or forsaken goals, and the ways we respond to them. Her work has focused on three grins who will never experience the kind of traditional, culturally endorsed family life that their parents have desired for them. They will not be as fully accepted by society as their straight peers. The final group is divorced women of long-established marriages who are unlikely to grow old with their long-loved partners. As distinctive as these people's situations are, the way that their life stories play out and the manner in which they reflect on their lost goals turn out to have tremendous implications for the rest of us who have our own unique burdens of personal loss themselves. Let's begin with the premise that setbacks, missteps, and regrets are inevitable in life. 90% of us, in fact, acknowledge harboring severe regrets. Although reflecting on things that we could have done but didn't, or things that we did but shouldn't have, or on awful things that happened to us over which we had no control, makes us feel bad in the present moment, King argues that the capacity to genuinely accept and confront one's regrets, to reflect on what might have been, can only be accomplished by a mature individual. The intriguing twist is that this process of reflecting on regrets can itself accelerate maturity. Thus, having lost possible selves, lost prime moment can be a teachable moment. King describes this process as akin to consulting our life map. In other words, imagine that every year we are moving along a map that includes a timeline, locations, goals, and situations. When a particular goal, say to make partner in a law firm, becomes untenable, we should refer to that imaginary map to find that you are here spot and ask ourselves, how did I get here? And where am I heading? So if your fantasy was always to play for the Yankees or the Mets or to visit China or to be a prompt newfound understanding and build self complexity. Indeed, as part of her research, King asks people what is undoubtedly a painful question. How great would your life have been if only you had been divorced? Your child didn't have Down syndrome. You were straight and not gay. She has found that the response is forsaken goals. Wouldn't all that self-excavation merely make us feel even more miserable and more regretful? In a word, yes. But we must do it. We must admit to ourselves that we have lost a cherished part of ourselves and, at the same time, a child with Down syndrome had this to say about her journey from the time before she had her baby to the months and years after. I was on the road to self-discovery. I was searching for a little more purpose. Years after, being a mother, being a wife, being a nurse was not enough. I wanted to fulfill my destiny. I wanted to continue on the search for self-actualization. Well, my son came along. Everything was tested. Values, beliefs, friendships, wedding vows, etc. 
much growth, difficult growth, lots of confusion, but I am on the other side now. I'm right back on track and could not cap here. I'm stronger, I'm more experienced, and God knows, I'm much more compassionate and humble. Yeah. This is a person who has successfully transformed her painful experience into a, if at all possible, she should use writing as a tool. For example, we might choose to write in a dear writing or camera and to describe the facts about our experiences as well as our thoughts and feelings about them. Alternatively, we could create lists of our options. If you experience any signs, try to distract yourself by focusing on mutual or pleasant thoughts or absorbing yourself in an engrossing activity like playing a video game, watch widely negative connotations in Western culture. However, research is called a counterfactual. While regret is really about forever closed off options, I'll never do X, counterfactuals are scientific jargon for the what ifs and might have beens or life's unexplored possibilities. Who would I be now if I had done X? Instead, it helps us to appreciate our key life transitions and to view the significance of those events in our lives from a big picture perspective. I admit that this logic is a bit counterintuitive. After all, or something that went wrong, for example, what if I said no to the affair? Although one would think that reflecting on the if onlys would make us miserable, after all, contemplating how our lives could have turned out differently seems like a sure formula for making us appreciate the other things in our lives. Instead of regretting that we didn't spend more time.